Welcome, I'm Mohammed Ahmed. I'm an anesthesiologist at Western University and London Health Sciences Center. My subspecialty is pediatric anesthesia and I will be presenting pediatric anesthesia for the Fanshawe College Anesthesia System Program. But the good news is that most children are adult-like. Their physiology is adult-like by age 2 and their anatomy is adult-like by age 8. They may still be smaller. The reason this is good news though is because a lot of the things you've already learned in the program will apply to pediatrics. The bad news? Well, infants especially are not just small children. Their physiology and anatomy are different. And another thing that we worry about, especially recently, is the neurotoxicity that anesthetics may present to the developing nervous system. Another point is that some adults remain childish despite their age and physiology. When approaching a pediatric patient, there are some special considerations. So they're anatomically smaller and they're physiologically different. They're unable to give a history which is important because you'll have to modify your history taking skills to accommodate children. They're also unable to give consent and a lot of time you have to get substitute consent from uh, their parents or caregivers. And one of the biggest considerations is that children are often uncooperative as they uh, develop uh, cognitively. They uh, level their level of cooperation changes because they're uncooperative sometimes they'll need an anesthetic for a procedure that an adult wouldn't require an anesthetic for for example an MRI scan which takes about 30 to 40 minutes well, is, a, is a challenge for a child they don't understand why they're having it they don't like the loud noises they don't like being still and to facilitate an MRI for example a child will give it will get an anesthetic. Another special consideration is that patients uh, who are adults often show up to the operating room or procedure room by themselves and they can give a history and consent but children come with parents and this creates some uh, complex family dynamics sometimes and it also presents some separation anxiety both for the child and for the parent. Now to do pediatric anesthesia you need uh, some special things uh, such as different equipment and medications. And these include warmers, IV pumps, uh, blood products come in different uh, uh, sizings for children. They're not just smaller, they're often just different as well. And oftentimes they don't exist or they're unapproved for kids and we just modify uh, adult uh, equipment and uh, medications for children. A lot of medications that we give children are not specifically approved for children so we're using them off-label. This requires a different mindset. It has to have buy-in from multiple groups institutionally, departmentally and an individual practitioner level. Childhood disorders differ from adult disorders. So when you think of adult disorders, you usually think of things like coronary artery disease, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, problems related to smoking. Uh, these are what we consider, consider progressive diseases. Adult diseases are well known and almost anybody doing any anesthesia training will be quite comfortable with them. Childhood diseases are different and because children make up such a small proportion of the patient population at hospitals uh, they don't tend to be as familiar. But some common childhood disorders are asthma, bronchiolitis, uh, congenital heart disease, cerebral palsy, hydrocephalus, leukemia and lots of dental caries. We see lots of those patients. There's also birth deformities, uh, metabolic syndromes and disorders, um, tonsillitis, and um, more recently, uh, sleep apnea. Uh, 
and common childhood procedures that we do that require general anesthesia are CT scanning, MRI scanning, endoscopy, lumbar punctures, bone marrow biopsy, radiation therapy, central line insertions, dental restorations. And all of these can often be done in adults without any anesthesia or with light anesthesia, but kids generally need a general anesthetic for this. And then we also do lots of surgeries like herniotomies, tonsillectomies, myringotomies. Now, as I mentioned, as children develop their cognitive understanding of why they're having procedures uh, improves. When you look at a child who is up to nine months, they generally don't have any separation anxiety and will accept uh, going with anybody that picks them up, uh, soothes them, coddles them, and sedation is unnecessary for these kids. From nine months to three years, kids do develop separation anxiety. They don't understand why they're being separated. This can be very upsetting for the child. It can be upsetting to the parent too. However, they do respond to distraction. Sometimes they require sedation, usually oral sedation. We do allow parents into the operating room um, on occasion. Uh, however, for kids nine months to three years, there's really no evidence that it's very beneficial to the child. It's very reassuring for the parents though and they're quite satisfied with accompanying their child into the operating room. Kids that are four to six years old they have more understanding and they start to understand that they may be injured by the procedure they're having especially surgery. They may have pain, they may have scarring. They respond to reassurance and play therapy However, they still need concrete explanations and instructions. At this age, having a parent present in the operating room for induction of anesthesia is beneficial to the child. Kids seven to 12 years old have started to develop abstract thought. They're anxious about, about everything that I've mentioned earlier. Plus they also become aware that they may lose control and they sometimes feel like they can't cope with that stress. They also respond to uh, engagement and sometimes sedation. Adolescents and older, they have become more uh, understanding that their uh, possibility of being aware during the procedure exists. Uh, they're also concerned about privacy. Now you may have a child who is chronologically at a certain age but developmentally delayed and they need to be treated according to their developmental age. And these are kids, for example, who are autistic, have cerebral palsy or have metabolic disorders. Now when you're thinking of pediatric physiology, you should have an understanding of what normal vital signs are. And I present the slide to you just so you can use it or as a reference to uh, to have a general idea of how vital signs change with age. Generally heart rate decreases with age, respiratory rate decreases with age, but blood pressure both systolic and diastolic increase with age. There are various formulas for calculating these and you can look them up. I won't go over them here but I want you just to have a general understanding. So we'll go through the anatomical or physical differences between uh, kids and adults uh, systemically. We'll start with the airway. And I'll focus on infants because they're really the ones that are different than adults. So infants can be difficult to intubate for a number of reasons. Everything is smaller. The larynx is more anterior. The epiglottis is narrower, longer, and stiffer. The vocal cords are slanted away from us when we're looking at them. The head and the occiput are larger. The kids desaturate quicker because their metabolic rate is higher. And they're also prone to laryngospasm, which I'll go into more detail later. The infant larynx or voice box is funnel shaped and the narrowest point is at the vocal cords. Traditionally, it's been taught that the narrowest point was at the cricoid, but recent anatomical studies using MRI and cadaveric studies have demonstrated that actually the vocal cords are the narrowest part. So when we're picking an endotracheal tube size, 
we want a size that will go through the vocal cords without putting excessive pressure on the vocal cords. Traditionally, in pediatric anesthesia, we would use uncuffed endotracheal tubes, but we're more and more we're using cuffed endotracheal tubes. And you can see here what I mean by a funnel-shaped larynx compared to a cylinder-shaped larynx. Now, when we go to intubate kids, we can calculate the endotracheal tube size by uh, various formulas. Uh, the one that's most popular is taking four millimeters and then taking the patient's age divided by four and adding them together. And then you would uh, pick the that endotracheal tube and have one size smaller or one size larger. And I mean half a size smaller, half a size larger available in case your uncuffed endotracheal tube ended up being too small or too large. Um, you sh the endotracheal tube should generally leak at 20 centimeters of water pressure. There's a formula for determining the depth of the endotracheal tube, which is 10 plus their age divided by two. You need a shoulder roll to compensate for the larger occiput. You need a donut to hold the head steady. And usually for infants, we prefer a straight blade. For uh, older kids, like older than one or two years old, the curved blade works well. Uh, and the reason we want to use a straight blade in infants is because the blade tip lift, lifts the epiglottis added view so we can expose the vocal cords. This slide here demonstrate what the uh, what the size of the infant uh, occiput um, and cranium uh, what effect they have on intubation. So in early infancy, you can see the cranium is quite large compared to the face. As the child gets older and becomes more adult-like, the cranium does not grow as much as the face. Getting back here, you can see that when we position a patient, if we did not put a shoulder roll in, like in this slide, the, he the chin would end up being touching the chest. What we do want to do is open up this space over here, making uh, intubation easier. So this model here represents uh, a shoulder roll under the patient's chin, uh, under the patient's shoulders to compensate for this bigger cranium and occiput. These are the different blades we have. So these are what are called straight blades or Miller blades, and these are what are called curved blades or Macintosh blades. You can see they come in various sizes. So like I said, generally for a child under a year old, we would use a Miller blade. And for over a year, a Macintosh blade becomes useful. Now, interestingly in kids, if you can't intubate with one blade, the easiest thing you can do is switch to a different blade and about 50% of the time you'll succeed. This slide demonstrates the impact of endotracheal tube size on airway resistance. I'm gonna compare a three and a half endotracheal tube to a 4.0 endotracheal tube. And you can see that a 3.5 endotracheal tube has 70% more resistance than a 4.0 endotracheal tube. Similarly, a 4.0 endotracheal tube has 60% more resistance than a 4.5 endotracheal tube. And this is because resistance varies with the diameter of the tube to the fourth power. That's Poussel's law. There are various uh, adjuncts to intubation, including a light wand, which is a very difficult uh, device to use in kids because you're blindly intubating a smaller uh, glottic opening or a smaller uh, vocal cord opening uh, without actually seeing the tube go through. This is uh, um, really um, an infrequently used technique nowadays, uh, mostly because it's difficult to sterilize light wands. And has 
it's been largely replaced by glide scopes as a backup technique. Uh, a, a glide scope is similar to an adult glide scope where you have a camera at the end of the blade here, you look at the screen, and what it really allows you to do is look around the corner. There are some types of airways in pediatrics that are commonly common and uh, predictably difficult, such as cleft palate, kids with obstructive sleep apnea, kids with Down syndrome because they have a large tongue and they can have unstable C-spine and they can have subglottic stenosis. And uh, another common condition is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis because they have limited mouth opening. They are prone to vocal cord dislocation, although clinically this does not happen uh, often, and it can also have unstable C-spines. There are also rare difficult airways, uh, usually associated with syndromes such as Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, uh, which presents with a very large protruding tongue, Piero Band syndrome, which is associated with micrognatha and glossotosis, which are small jaw and lax tongue. Treacher Collins syndrome, which is associated with mandibular hypoplasia, which is a small upper jaw and maxillary hypoplasia, uh, sorry, which is a small upper jaw and a small lower jaw. And Klippelfield syndrome, which presents with a short neck with sort of webbing and limited neck mobility. So other than endotracheal intubation, we can also use light wands, uh, sorry, we can also use laryngeal masks uh, in pediatrics. They come in various sizes from one to five. Now usually in pediatrics you use size one, one and a half, two, two and a half, or three. We rarely use the size one because it doesn't tend to be very stable. It's for kids under five kilograms. Who, Generally at that uh, size and age, they don't have teeth and it's hard to keep the LMA sitting in place. Nice thing about uh, LMAs is they're not very stimulating to put in. The kids, we usually do an inhalation induction by applying a face mask to the patient with sevoflurane or another anesthetic agent running. That'll put the patient to sleep. Once they're asleep, we can put the LMA in and then go do an IV. And that's relatively safe compared to putting an endotracheal tube in, which is very stimulating, and uh, if the patient's not deep enough or they get light as you're trying to put the endotracheal tube in, they can get laryngospasm. So as I said, laryngeal mask, it's safe to put it in before an IV, but generally with an endotracheal tube, we want an IV before we try to put in the endotracheal tube. Laryngeal masks are sized by weight, and it says the weight range on the device. Unlike in the tracheal tubes, which are sized by age. Next, we'll talk about body fluids. So, uh, children generally have more total body water, but they have less fat and less muscle. So, they're less, they have less ability to redistribute drugs, such as narcotics or propofol to fat and muscle. They have less uh, protein binding because they have less albumin and less alpha glycoprotein which are circulating in the blood and bind a lot of drugs. They can also have hyperbilirubinemia shortly after birth and the bilirubin can displace drugs off these two proteins. This results in more free active drug now these are concerns, but they generally don't have much impact in clinical practice. And we'll talk about dose ranging for kids later in the talk. So you can see here as kids uh, age, their amount of total body water in the gray bar decreases with age from prematurity, infancy to adulthood. Muscle mass increases and fat increases and then decreases into adulthood. When you're doing pediatric anesthesia, especially procedures where you might expect blood loss, you should have an understanding of how much blood the patient actually has. And you can calculate it by knowing their weight. And usually for severely premature infants, it's about 100 milliliters per kilogram.
For a term infant, it's 85 milliliters per kilogram. For a four-year-old, it's 75 uh, milliliters per kilogram. So, for instance, let's say you have a 16-kilogram uh, kid. You can calculate that their blood volume is going to be about 1,200 milliliters. You can do the same for adults. If you have a 70-kilogram adult, they'll have about 70 milliliters per kilogram blood volume. That means their blood volume will be about 4.9 liters. The infant heart is relatively immature. It doesn't have a lot of muscle, about 50% less muscle than in the adult heart. The muscle fibers are not linearly arranged, so they're relatively inefficient. The infant heart also has a fibrous tissue, which makes it a bit stiff. The result is that the infant stroke volume is relatively fixed. And it makes the cardiac output or the amount of blood pumping per minute dependent on the heart rate. In an adult, the stroke volume or the amount of blood ejected with each beat can vary up to threefold. The infant heart is working near its maximal, usually about 75% of its maximal uh, at rest. That doesn't give the kid a lot of uh, leeway to increase their cardiac output in times of stress. They're less tolerant of low or high filling pressures of the heart. They can also have congenital problems such as uh, shunts, such as patent foramen ovale or patent ductus arteriosus, and these can take weeks to months to resolve. Some kids will be dependent on these remaining open because they have some other congenital heart defect. Kids are also more prone to hypotension because of anesthetic-induced myocardial depression. When we talk about lung volumes, uh, generally they're similar to adult lung volumes, uh, but the minute volume in a, in a child has to be higher because their metabolic rate is higher. And that's made up by having a higher respiratory rate. Now remember with our slide on vital signs, we said that as kids age, their respiratory rate decreases. One nice thing about the higher minute volume in kids is it makes in induction of anesthesia by inhaled anesthetic quicker. Kids do have higher closing volumes and what this means is that their airways can collapse. Even in the tidal volume range they can have small airway collapse and that risks air trapping especially at high respiratory rates. Infants have normal response to CO2, but with hypoxia, they tend to uh, get apneic. And this improves with gestational age, with postnatal age, and with temperature. So what I mean by this is when you compare to an adult who gets hyperventilatory when they get hypoxic, an infant will get I will get uh, apneic, they will desat, they will get bradycardic. Kids also have a higher work of breathing. So remember, their metabolic rate is about three times that of an adult, and they, so they spend about 1% of their metabolic energy on breathing. The reason it's, their breathing is inefficient is they have a smaller airway, their trachea is compliant and partially collapses when they're breathing. And you'll see this when you watch an infant breathe. Look at the bottom of their neck and you'll see the, the trachea collapse. They also have compliant rib, ribs, so when you watch them you'll see that their ribs move inward when they take a breath. As I mentioned, they have a higher closing volume and so they can air trap. Uh, that's what functional airway closure means. They have a higher metabolic rate and higher min alveolar minute ventilation. In kids, the breathing is diaphragmatic. And what that means is that their intercostals, which provide a lot of the supplementary ventilation in adults, just don't work. So kids are completely dependent on their diaphragmatic up until about age three to six months. 
The anesthetic in the older kids can block the intercostals and making the diaphragmatic breathing even more pronounced. Ribs in kids are more horizontal than in adults, so it makes them inefficient even when they are being used to breathe. And because the ribs in infants are cartilaginous, they can collapse. They're not rigid like an adult's ribs. Small kids also don't have a lot of fatigue resistant muscle fibers in their diaphragm. They have muscle fibers that will fatigue uh, earlier than in adults. And what that means is that kids will run into respiratory failure and fatigue uh, earlier than an adult would with the, the same uh, respiratory um, uh, work. There are signs of respiratory distress that you should be familiar with. These include tachypnea, increased effort, strider, which is a high-pitched uh, sound indicative of upper airway obstruction, nasal flaring, which means there's a high rate of airflow, wheezing, uh, grunting. Grunting is a mechanism that uh, kids use to generate auto peep to keep their alveoli distended. In drawing, which usually means they're trying to generate more negative pressure to move air. And other things like drooling and gurgling, which means they're having problems coping with their secretions. Now remember we said the inner costals are ineffective in kids. and they can get tracheal tugging. And when you're watching a kid, you can watch as the severity of the respiratory distress gets worse, the, the signs of respiratory distress uh, become more and more visible um, from the lower part of the uh, rib cage up to the trachea. So if you see tracheal tugging and supraclavicular indrawing, that means that the child is in a lot of respiratory distress. So it means that when a child is in initially in respiratory distress, all you might see is some indrawing of their ribs. When they're in severe respiratory distress, you'll see uh, tracheal tugging and uh, supraclavicular indrawing. They'll start using their accessory muscles of respiration uh, to uh, stent their airway open. Head bobbing is a sign of severe respiratory distress. And when they're using their abdominal muscles, just like in adults, that's a sign of severe respiratory distress. This is a handy chart from the Pediatric Advanced Life Support book. And it goes through a lot of the things that I've sort of mentioned. Uh, there's respiratory distress on this side and respiratory failure on this side. The goal is to identify respiratory distress and intervene becomes, before it becomes respiratory failure. Oftentimes with respiratory failure, the signs typical of respiratory distress are absent because the patient has fatigued. For example, if they're initially tachypneic when they're in distress, they may become apneic or, brid or uh, bridipneic uh, when they're in failure because they don't have the energy to make the effort anymore. That's a child who is in severe um, uh, circumstances and is imminently going to arrest. Similarly, tachycardia is a sign of respiratory distress. Bradycardia is a sign of failure and hypoxia. Now we'll go on to renal function. Kidney function matures by about age one year in kids. So it's generally not a big thing you need to worry about. Liver function matures by about age two. Other than the risk of hypoglycemia, we don't really need to modify our anesthetics very much. Kids under two months of age should definitely have a sugar-containing solution in their IV because they're prone to hypoglycemia. As they get past two months, their ability to, to maintain their blood sugars, which are provided by their liver, um, improves. This just summarizes the risk of hypoglycemia. Usually you use a D5W or D10 uh, solution. And these are the fasting guidelines we have at our hospital. So they're different than the adult guidelines. 
So generally we, we tell adults to fast from 2400 hours, but for an infant, uh, that really wouldn't be reasonable. We do allow them to have uh, breast milk uh, or formula up to six hours, nowadays up to four hours before surgery, and clear fluids up to two hours before surgery. This is because kids don't tolerate fasting because the metabolic rate is higher and their water requirements are higher. There are signs of hypoglycemia they should be aware of, including tremors, jitteriness, irritability, lethargy, poor feeding, apnea, tachypnea, hypothermia, and uh, exaggerated startle reflex, which is the reflex that you get when you uh, quickly uh, take a baby and let them fall in your hand uh, by about six to eight inches and they will appear to grab with their arms. You don't need to do that. Just, just check them by checking with a glucometer. Children are also prone to hypothermia and that's because they have a relatively high body surface area to mass or volume. They don't also have a lot of subcutaneous fat, so there's not a lot of insulation. They can't shiver for the first three months of uh, life. And anesthetics impair their ability to regulate their temperature at the brainstem level. Anesthetics also impair shivering. And it also impairs uh, thermogenesis by brown fat, which are fat pads uh, found around some of the major organs, such as the kidneys, uh, that uh, infants can use to generate heat by burning that fat. That fat is one time only. Once they burn it off, they don't have any more for the rest of their lives. You should be familiar with sources of heat loss. So most heat loss in the operating room is going to be due to radiation, which is just the difference in temperature between the child and the surrounding environment. And that depends on the difference in temperature between the child and the environment to the fourth power. So even a small... Uh, Increase in the room temperature will significantly reduce the amount of radiant heat loss. Other sources of heat loss are convection, which is heat loss by cold air blowing across the patient, uh, and conduction, which is heat loss due to the child being in contact with a cold surface like an operating room table. There is also evaporative heat loss, which is heat loss uh, due to water evaporating from uh, things like mucous surfaces, um, the mouth, uh, the nose, uh, or open incisions such as the abdomen or the chest. And we can reduce most of the heat loss just by covering up the patient. That's the easiest, most effective thing you can do. And that's why you'll see, for example, when a baby is born, one of the first things they'll do is dry off the baby to reduce the evaporative heat loss and wrap the baby up to reduce the other sources of heat loss. And this is a picture showing you graphically the sources of heat loss. Now there is this uh, concept of the neutral thermal environment which is the temperature of a room that you would need to keep the heat loss minimal where the child does not have to use any extra metabolism or oxygen to keep themselves warm. It's pretty high for a premature infant, 28 to 34 degrees. For an older child, a little lower. For an adult, it's about 21 to 24 degrees. Now, if you're ever in an operating room, you would realize that having an operating room this warm can make you quite uncomfortable. Uh, because generally in, in the operating room, the surgeons need to wear gowns to be sterile. Uh, and there is um, other people in the operating room uh, that are wearing gowns, gloves, hats. Uh, most operating rooms are kept at 18 degrees Celsius uh, for sterility and for patient comfort. Uh, sorry, for staff comfort. Now, hypothermia does have effects. Uh, that are significant for the patient. They can depress consciousness by reducing uh, the uh, met metabolic rate of the brain. This delays emergence and it also blunts the hypoxic uh, drive uh, in neonates. Uh, 
uh, hypothermia can cause coagulopathies, so the patients actually lose more blood when they're cold, cause arrhythmias, especially uh, we can worry about ventricular arrhythmias such as ventricular fibrillation. That generally only happens when patients are very cold, under 33 degrees Celsius, which is extremely rare to happen. More likely it would happen in a trauma patient freshly arriving at the hospital. Hypothermia also causes peripheral vasoconstriction, which leads to hypertension because the vasoconstricted blood vessels, especially in the skin, which is a large organ, uh, will increase the amount of work that the heart has to do to pump blood through those constricted blood vessels. And to do that, the blood pressure has to rise. Hypothermia also increases cardiorespiratory work by peripheral vasoconstriction, by making the blood more viscous, uh, by making the pulmonary vascular resistance higher, leading to um, something akin to pulmonary hypertension. I, I think that's probably the easiest way you can think about it. And uh, shivering will also increase cardiorespiratory work because when you shiver, it increases your metabolic rate, which increases cardiac output and, meta and uh, respiratory rate. And also being cold is uncomfortable for patients. Different ways we can warm patients in the operating room, including a forced air warmer, a radiant warmer for infants, uh, warming IV fluids, and the easiest, most effective thing is actually to warm the room. This is what we call a bear hugger or a warming blanket. So this is the machine for it. It's hooked up to a blanket that looks like this, blows warm air on the patient. This is how we typically set up the operating room for, a, for an infant. This is a warming blanket. Oftentimes we'll put it under the patient if the patient's very small, so the patient uh, can be seen, all parts of the patient can be seen, including the IV sites and the oximeter, the ECG lead, the blood pressure cuff, uh, the surgical site. This is a radiant warmer. And I include over here the thermostat in the room. This plastic sheet is placed over the patient as well to reduce uh, convective and radiant heat loss. So we'll go on to history and physical exam now. So the history uh, taking in a child can be quite difficult, like I said, because they often can't give a history. Sometimes they can't even talk. So you have to take it from their parents um, or depend on the chart uh, if the parents aren't available, which uh, occasionally does happen, especially in patients who are hospitalized for a long time. The parents will often go home uh, just as you need to see them. Uh, but the history for a child should include their birth history, especially whether they had a premature birth, because there are complications of prematurity that impact the anesthetic. So for example, they have a history of prolonged intubation, then we would worry about tracheal stenosis, tracheomalacia, and vocal cord paralysis. Also, if the patient had apneas uh, in prematurity, they're still going to be prone to apneas for two to three months after uh, they are no longer premature. If they had bronchopulmonary dysplasia in prematurity, then that can manifest as uh, reactive airways disease for years uh, afterwards. Another thing you want to ask about is growth and development. So patients who are generally growing well won't have cardiorespiratory or nutritional problems. Kids that have developmental problems, you might have to approach uh, more from a de developmental age rather than chronological age, like I mentioned before. Kids often have respiratory tract infections, so you definitely want to ask about those. You don't want to operate on a child who has an acute respiratory tract infection if you don't have to. And uh, you want to ask about loose teeth, which are quite frequent and can present a hazard when you're trying to intubate somebody. On physical exam, kids often won't cooperate with the physical exam. 
So there's a few things you can try to do to build rapport with kids. You can uh, greet the child first, then the parents, or vice versa. Marriage with the child. If the child's hiding behind their parents, then talk to the parents first and try to demonstrate that you uh, have the trust of the parents. When you're talking with children, you want to approach them in a non-threatening manner. So talk eye to eye with them. Uh, when you want to examine them, you might examine uh, a part that's distal, such as the hands first, and then work your way to the heart and the lungs to listen to, to those. The airway exam is usually incomplete in a kid because uh, they won't open their mouths uh, on uh, request, or you can't get a good Mal and Patty score due to poor effort. Uh, but generally, airway exam is not that uh, concerning in kids as it is in adults. Uh, most difficult airways you're going to run into in kids are in kids with syndromes. You might have to defer the heart and lung exams until the patient's asleep. And a very thing, important thing to know in kids is what their weight, because all your drug dosing is going to be by uh, weight. Uh, LMA sizing is going to be by weight. Uh, your blood volume estimation is going to be by weight. Laboratory testing is usually not uh, indicated for kids. Some kids may, may need it because they have metabolic disorders, they have hematological disorders. And uh, kids of African ancestry may need a sickle cell screen preoperatively. However, most kids born since 2010 will have had a neonatal sickle cell screen, and the sickle cell screen is not uh, uh, necessary to repeat. Uh, there's really no reason to poke them uh, repeatedly for a sickle cell screen uh, when they were screened at birth. Managing preoperative anxiety can be a bit of a challenge, but most of the work uh, can be done just by preparation, by preparing the parents. The child should have some understanding of what the intended procedure and plan are. You need preparation by a child life specialist for especially anxious kids. Child life specialists are, are uh, healthcare uh, providers who are especially trained to uh, teach kids to manage anxiety uh, with cognitive techniques, play therapy, etc. And this can be done on the day of the procedure or uh, preoperatively. You can use parental presence at induction to help kids uh, with their anxiety at the time of induction. Uh, some kids are you know, just scared to go to the operating room, so having their parent with them will help with that. And then finally, you can use sedative medications for kids who are extremely anxious and not responding to the above measures. Now parental presence at induction is often allowed uh, if the child is between one to eight years old or developmentally delayed. So you'll even have adults who will have their elderly parents or maybe even their siblings or a friend come to the operating room, operating room with them until they are uh, put to sleep uh, either by mask or ID. Now it's critically important that the person accompanying the child is healthy, calm, and supportive. Um, now sometimes the uh, parents will want to come into the operating room even for very young children, but as I mentioned before, the evidence for parental presence uh, is not very strong for kids under four years of old. However, parents tend to be very satisfied uh, with going with their child into the operating room. And so it's a pillar of patient and family-centered care to allow parents this opportunity. When it comes to oral sedation, we don't really do very much of it here in London. It's been decreasing in popularity. Mostly we try cognitive techniques, building rapport and preparation. Uh, to get the child uh, to be cooperative. You, you really need, do need a child-friendly uh, environment. And nowadays, you know, we allow kids to bring like a stuffed animal with them or to uh, bring a tablet so they can watch a video while they're going to the operating room. Even while induction, they can watch a video. Uh, they'll fall asleep oftentimes uh, in the middle of the video. However, back to oral sedation, it does prolong the recovery time if the surgery is short. 
So timing is very important. It may increase emergence delirium. Sometimes you get a kid who is actually more agitated after getting oral sedation. This is a, a well-known problem with uh, midazolam especially, called the paradoxical response. Now, the back to the timing, you need a uh, good timing because you don't want to take the patient to the operating room before the sedation is kicked in or after the sedation is worn off. You want to take the child usually around 20 to 30 minutes after the sedation has been given because that's when they're going to be most uh, sedated um, and cooperative. Usually the sedation is given in the uh, preoperative holding area, it can be given orally, it can be given uh, nasally, but generally we try to give it orally. Uh, midazolam itself is very bitter and has to be mixed with Tylenol or apple juice or something else that's clear that makes it taste better. Another problem that might, might happen is that if you're running late or a patient has a cold or isn't fasting properly, their surgery is going to get cancelled and if you've sedated the kid then that you have to wait until they've re recovered from the sedation before sending them home uh, because of the canceled surgery. There's also intramuscular sedation, which is the least common, not very pleasant, uh, which involves sticking a needle in a child and injecting midazolam or ketamine uh, into, into their arm or leg. Um, they're, usually it's reserved for kids who are very uncooperative and won't take anything orally. Oftentimes it will be an autistic teenager. That's the typical case where you would use uh, IM sedation. It doesn't really afford you a lot of physical control or airway control, so we don't consider it a safe option. But for some kids, there's no other way you're going to get them into the operating room. There are different routes of um, putting patients to sleep. So there's the intravenous route where you start an IV awake and you inject your induction medications, usually propofol, and put the patient to sleep. The other option is an inhalational anesthetic where you place a face mask on the patient, put some sevoflurane on, and have them breathe it until they fall asleep. And I'll compare the two different techniques. So the intravenous induction uh, is um, usually propofol, IV. It's preferred uh, because it's faster um, induction, sorry, faster time to unconsciousness. Uh, better airway control because the period of time where uh, they are in that middle phase of anesthesia where they're not awake and, and not asleep is shorter. Uh, so most kids will lose consciousness with an IV induction within seconds. So it's safer. It also provides you a rapid and reliable way to give rescue drugs if you need to. However, IV insertion can be difficult in an awake child. You can add Emla cream, which is a numbing cream uh, to the IV uh, site 30 to 40 minutes before you do the IV to blunt the pain. Induction of anesthesia uh, by inhalation induction usually involves sevoflurane. Usually you dial it up to 48% uh, ahead of time You'll, before the patient uh, comes into the room so the circuit is primed. You apply the face mask, make sure you don't have an air leak, and then the patient uh, breathes the, the gas. You sort of have to encourage them to do this because the sevoflurane doesn't s smell all that great. And most kids will fall asleep within a minute. An infant might fall asleep in 30 seconds. A 10-year-old might take two or three minutes to fall asleep. So it's slower than an IV induction, and that means there's longer period of time until you have physical and airway control. Sometimes you, you have a child who does have an IV, but you still do an inhalation induction anyways. Um, For example, you might have a patient who you suspect a difficult airway in and you want to keep them breathing spontaneously. Or they have a pneumothorax, you don't want to apply any positive pressure to a patient with a pneumothorax because that will just make the pneumothorax worse. 
you have a pericardial tamponade, it's better to have spontaneous ventilation because once you apply uh, positive pressure ventilation to somebody with a pericardial tamponade, you'll decrease their venous return and they'll get hypotensive. A patient with mediastinal mass may get airway collapse uh, with an IV induction. So traditionally, they'll get an inhalation induction with an IV already in place for safety. Or if you're doing airway surgery, you might want to keep the patient breathing spontaneously. So that's for a patient who already has an IV. Sometimes as a patient, you can't get an IV in. Even an adult, sometimes you can't get an IV in. And doing an inhalation induction actually vasodilates the veins and makes an IV induction uh, or an IV insertion easier. Generally, we don't encourage it. There are different gases that you can use for uh, inhalational anesthesia. You can use nitrous oxide at induction to speed up uh, inhalational induction. However, this limits the amount of oxygen that you can give. Usually you would use 50 to 70 percent nitrous oxide, which means you can only give 30 to 50 percent oxygen. Nitrous oxide is nice in that it speeds up uptake of the other anesthetic gases. So that's called the second gas effect. It also has some analgesic properties. So some kids, you can just give them nitrous oxide. And because it doesn't have an odor, they tolerate it well. Just give them nitrous oxide. They get a little bit sleepy and it blunts the pain. And you can oftentimes do an IV just with nitrous oxide. Nowadays, we don't use nitrous oxide so much for maintenance because it's associated with post-operative nausea and vomiting. These are the other anesthetic agents that we have available. They're halothane, isoflurane, sevoflurane, and uh, desflurane. Now, halothane is rarely ever used nowadays. I haven't seen it in years myself. Uh, the vaporizers uh, are out there. They do work. Uh, you can uh, probably most likely find it in a veterinary practice. Isoflurane is also a bit of an older anesthetic, not very commonly used uh, nowadays. Uh, except for longer operations. That the reason that we would use it is because it's very cheap compared to sevoflurane and desflurane. Uh, I'll talk about desflurane, then I'll go on to sevoflurane. So desflurane is a relatively newer inhaled anesthetic. It has rapid onset. It doesn't smell very good at all. It actually smells quite bad. Um, and um, it's expensive. It's an airway irritant as well causing uh, coughing and secretions. Sevoflurane is the anesthetic agent of choice in pediatrics because it's the one that smells the least terrible. Uh, it smells a lot like a smelly marker or uh, chocolate. So sometimes if you tell kids that, they'll, uh, they'll accept it more. It has a relatively rapid onset and it doesn't really have much of a, a effect on heart rhythm or myocardial depression doesn't tend to cause hypotension uh, and it's relatively um, easy when going when it causes when it comes to laryngospasm which I'll talk about later it does however have a high rate of emergence delirium which is sort of this cognitive state that kids have when they wake up where they're just confused crying very upset uh, when they wake up from an anesthetic um, it's not pain it's not you know, uh, separation anxiety. They're just upset and we don't really know what causes it, but it tends to be more commonly found with, uh, with uh, sevoflurane. Usually what we do is just give the kids a little bit of IV uh, propofol to, to make them uh, a little sedate again and wait for the emergency delirium to wear off. Uh, sevoflurane is relatively expensive, but despite that, it's the induction agent of choice. So how do we go about inducing anesthesia in a kid? Well, the typical routine is to bring the child into the room, put them on the operating room table, uh, show them the face mask, uh, place the face mask, ensure a good seal, and then turn on the sevoflurane fluorine if it isn't already turned on. Wait two to five minutes until they get quite sleepy. Then you can insert an LMA. Then you can start an IV. Then you can give supplemental IV drugs. Then you can intubate if needed. And uh, turn down the anesthetic uh, once the um, uh, IV and supplemental drugs uh, are in the patient's intubated. And perform your, uh, your remaining tasks. 
including the procedures such as surgery or MRI. When is it safe to intubate during an inhalation induction? Well, generally you want the patient to be quite deep, at least two MAC of anesthesia for so for sevoflurane, that would be uh, four to five percent uh, sevoflurane. They should have sinusoidal or regular pattern breathing, uh, midline eyes, and you want a 20 percent reduction in heart rate and blood pressure. If the patient's too deep, you'll run into problems such as hypotension, bradycardia, uh, hemodynamic collapse, and you can also have airway collapse because of loss of muscle tone in the airway. Supplemental drugs you might give prior to intubation are opioids. You might give some propofol to prevent uh, laryngeal spasm and speed up the induction. That would be a, almost like a hybrid induction where it's both uh, inhaled uh, to get the IV then completed with an IV uh, induction. Uh, and the reason you, you might want to make the patient deeper uh, at this point is because when you take the face mask off, you're not going to be delivering any inhaled anesthetic and the patient will breathe room air and just a few breaths of room air can uh, make the patient light enough to get laryngeal spasm. So really that's the goal is to prevent laryngeal spasm. You can give muscle relaxants, but muscle relaxants aren't usually required in kids. In adults, you might use a muscle relaxant to intubate or for the purpose of the surgery, but kids, uh, it's so easy to intubate them without muscle relaxants that oftentimes they don't need any muscle relaxant for surgery that you can avoid it. And for small infants, you might give them atropine to avoid hypoxia-induced bradycardia. Now, you're applying the inhaled anesthetic through an anesthetic machine circuit. And most adult circuits uh, are fine for kids. For the very small kids, uh, under 20 kilograms, you might want a smaller filter, which I'll show you next. Um, for long cases, especially in infants, you might want to warm and humidify uh, the airway gases. Uh, you want to minimize the dead space uh, by using a smaller uh, filter. So this is an adult filter, which is 35 milliliters of dead space. This is a pediatric filter, which is 8 milliliters of dead space. So you can see here that if you had a kid whose tidal volume was, let's say, 40 mils, and you used an adult filter, you wouldn't be ventilating them very effectively. It would only be really five mil tidal volume of effective ventilation that you would be giving them uh, if you gave them a 40 mil tidal volume. While well, here, your effective tidal volume is, would be 32 milliliters if you're using a 40 milliliter uh, tidal volume on your ventilator. This is what I mean by a typical anesthetic uh, circuit that we use for adults. The dead space in this circuit, uh, which is what we use at our hospital, is 14 milliliters. You apply a, a face mask uh, to it. Um, now this, fill, this circuit here is actually an infant circuit. It has 4 milliliters of dead space compared to 14 milliliters here. Uh, now the reason I'm showing you these uh, circuits is because this is what we would use for an infant. We would leave the filters off the patient end and we would put them at the machine end unlike uh, these filters which we would normally put at the uh, between the mask and the circuit. So we maintain anesthesia uh, by um, two techniques, either intravenous uh, maintenance or inhalational maintenance, and we talked about this in uh, earlier lectures. Uh, if it's intravenous maintenance, uh, then it's almost always propofol plus an opioid, possibly a muscle relaxant. And children need about 200 to 300 micrograms per kilogram per minute. That should be minute uh, here um, of uh, propofol um, to keep them at a surgical anesthetic depth. Now, early on when patients had high rates of this for hours on end, uh, there were rate, reports of brain death, but generally when you're doing intravenous maintenance, you would start off at 2 to, two to 300 micrograms per kilogram per minute and decrease that every 40 minutes down to about 120 to 150 micrograms per kilogram per minute. 
Uh, usually intravenous maintenance is used for procedural sedation or malignant hyperthermia patients. Inhalational maintenance requires a sealed airway, such as an endotracheal tube or a laryngeal mask, or a tight-fitting face mask uh, held by uh, the, uh, the anesthesiologist or assistant, uh, so you don't get contamination into the room. There's a high rate of emergency delirium with uh, inhaled anesthesia, about 30% compared to about 3% for intravenous maintenance. And the MAC requirements for kids are higher than for adults. So this is how MAC changes with age. So at birth, it's lower and increases gradually for about two months, and then it decreases over the lifespan. When it comes to waking up patients or emergence, it's really no different than adults, but there is a higher risk of laryngospasm uh, at emergence with kids. There are uh, two general approaches to extubation. There is deep extubation, where you take the endotracheal tube or LMA out uh, when the patient's still asleep before you've lightened them up at all. Generally, you need to suction them well, and you want two MAC of anesthesia, midline eyes, and spontaneous ventilation. You take out the, the endotracheal tube, and you hold the airway uh, manually by hand with a face mask, possibly with an oral airway uh, until the patient wakes up. Or you can do a deep extubation where you turn off the anesthetic, make sure the patient is really awake, uh, not partially awake. Uh, there is risk of coughing and retching. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're awake. That just means they're not tolerating the endotracheal tube. Uh, but don't extubate them just because you see coughing or, or, or retching because uh, that is a time when they're at risk of laryngospasm. Sometimes you'll extubate a child and they'll go to sleep again because you've removed the stimulus of the endotracheal tube. Uh, this child you have to be careful of because they're at risk of laryngospasm. So generally, in that situation, you don't leave the operating room until the patient's awake again. Now, about 50% of extubations in kids will be deep, and about 50% will be awake, depending on the anesthesiologist's preference, but largely depending on the type of surgery. So for an airway operation, for example, you generally don't do a deep extubation. Uh, but for like a foot operation, a deep extubation is fine. Uh, even for tonsillectomy, though, I should mention that uh, deep extubations are quite common. So this is another summary of uh, deep and awake extubation. Um, another thing to keep in mind, though, you don't want to do a deep extubation if the patient has a full stomach because they can't uh, prevent themselves from aspirating. So full stomach. Uh, or severe gastric reflux, let's say, requires an awake extubation. After the patient's uh, extubated, you generally put them in their recovery position, which is something we do for kids, but uh, not so commonly for adults, although you could argue for adults we should uh, be doing this too. Uh, it requires minimal airway support in this position. It reduces uh, accumulation of secretions in the airway keeps the secretions off the vocal cords, prevents aspiration. Now, emergence delirium, as I mentioned before, is a patient who is awake but inconsolable, not related to pain, not related to separation anxiety. Usually it lasts about five to 15 minutes and the cause is unknown. And it happens around 25% of the time with inhalational anesthetics, about 3% of the time with IV anesthetics. These are the risk factors, age two to five years, preoperative anxiety, behavioral disorders, and sevoflurane. Treatment are either just wait, wait it out, uh, but if the patient's flailing and at risk of hurting themselves, then you should consider resedating them. And usually they wake up better the second time around. You can resedate them with propofol, midazolam, or fentanyl if they still have their IV in. Uh, there's nothing that prevents it 100% of the time. Uh, but commonly, uh, anesthesiologists will give a small dose of propofol before uh, waking up the patient from an inhalational anesthetic to try to prevent uh, emergence delirium. Uh, laryngospasm, as I mentioned before, is uh, something that we need to be very wary of. 
its vocal cord closure, which causes an acute uh, airway obstruction, it tends to happen in younger kids, especially kids with a respiratory tract infection. It happens when you stimulate the patient or extubate them when they're too light. Um, it can happen with laryngoscopy uh, as well, uh, with IV insertion, with skin incision when they're light, uh, or anal dilatation uh, typically causes laryngospasm. And it um, can also happen if there's blood or secretions on the vocal cords. And really what it represents is incomplete suppression of the brainstem reflexes. Now, of course, it only happens when you don't have an endotracheal tube sitting between the cords. Uh, it happens when patients are uh, not intubated. So it can happen at induction. It can happen at emergence after a deep extubation. It can happen with procedures where just a face mask or a laryngeal mask are used. This is what it looks like. So it's partial or complete closure of the vocal cords. So these vocal cords are uh, largely closed. These ones are wide open. On the right hand side, you can see the vocal cords are wide open. You can see the tracheal rings. So laryngospasm is airway obstruction. You can't move any oxygen in and out and it can lead to rapid desaturation, possibly to a respiratory arrest. Treatment uh, for laryngospasm uh, is, uh, well, vigilance. You should always be vigilant, looking out for it. Usually it's a high-pitched sound, uh, but you can often predict when it's going to happen, uh, when the patient's light and you've stimulated them, really. Uh, but one of the first things you can do is uh, provide positive pressure ventilation uh, or just continuous positive pressure by turning up the APL valve uh, on the, the anesthetic circuit to about 10 or so to try to stent the vocal cords open. You can try lidocaine and propofol, but if the patient's really decompensating, then you should use succinylcholine, uh, unless they're malignant hyperthermia susceptible, of course. The reason succinylcholine uh, is your rescue medication of choice is because it's the quickest, it's also the most reliable, and generally it's a drug that you will always have drawn up when you're doing pediatric anesthesia. Drawn up as an emergency drug alongside atropine. Post-extubation strider is um, Similar, sounds similar to a laryngospasm. It's a high pitched noise that you'll hear on inspiration uh, because of tracheal or vocal cord edema. Oftentimes it's caused by just pressure on the trachea or vocal cords by having an endotracheal tube that's too wide or over, over inflated cuff. Uh, prolonged intubation, multiple attempts at intubation, rigid bronchoscopy can also cause it. Anaphylaxis can cause uh, airway edema that manifests as strider. Usually you'll hear it uh, not immediately after extubation, but you know, three to 20 minutes afterwards. And usually with treatment such as with epinephrine, it'll last for about two hours. Uh, sometimes you need repeated doses of epinephrine, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, if it's due to aspiration, vocal cord injury, or airway surgery, then uh, you'll hear sooner and it'll last indefinitely. Now, the reason it's important is because the edema that's caused by uh, by by the um, uh, the, the edema uh, causes uh, increased airway resistance, and the patient can fail extubation because of this. Remember. Uh, airway resistance is related to the diameter to the fourth power of the of the lumen of the airway. Same thing with the endotracheal tubes, like I mentioned earlier. So signs of post extubation are strider, are tachypnea, nasal flaring, sternal intercostal indrawing, desaturation. So typical signs of respiratory distress plus audible strider. And strider is a high pitched sound on inspiration, uh, not on expiration. If you get uh, expiratory strider uh, that has uh, potentially other causes including foreign body in the airway uh, but we won't get into that right now. How do you treat it? Well, humidified oxygen, dexamethasone 0.5 milligrams per kilogram which is a relatively big dose and you want to give that early because that's ultimately what's going to reduce that edema.
Uh, you can give nebulized epinephrine, which is just a temporizing measure until the dexamethasone kicks in. Uh, these are the doses. You small dose for a small kid, five milligrams for a kid over four years. Um, watch for rebound strider in about two hours time because that's how long the epinephrine will last. Sometimes you have to re-intubate a small, smaller child with a smaller endotracheal tube and take them to the intensive care unit uh, and give them uh, a night uh, on a ventilator for the airway demon to come down. Oftentimes it's repeated doses of dexamethasone. Now fluid management in kids is important. Uh, we determine their, their basal fluid uh, rate by the f same 4-2-1 rule that we would use for adults. And we would add glucose if the child is less than two months or has any metabolic disorders or prolonged fasting. Those are the maintenance fluids. Now for replacement fluids such as uh, blood loss or fluid loss because of the surgery, tissue edema, then you would use what's called a replacement fluid, which is usually Ringer's lactate or normal saline, but sometimes albumin um, or blood products. But I'll talk about that shortly. And you can determine how much uh, basal fluid replacements required depending on the type of surgery. So minor surgery often requires zero to five, uh, sorry, that's milliliters per kilogram per hour, moderate surgeries, five to 10, and major surgeries, 10 to 40 uh, milliliters per kilogram per hour. You replace uh, blood loss with crystalloid sometimes, especially early on in the blood loss. Uh, but once you lose uh, enough blood, uh, usually more than 20 to 30 percent of the patient's blood volume, you start using uh, red blood cells, um, usually around 20 milliliters per kilogram each time until you get the desired effect, either by measuring their hemoglobin um, on a blood gas or a CBC, or you look for clinical signs. Same thing with platelets is an FFP. So blood loss uh, if with pack cells or these uh, FFP platelets, you replace one to one, one volume to one volume. But if you're using crystalloids such as ringers or saline, like I said early on, you want to replace three to one because only one third of the normal saline, for example, will stay in the blood vessel. Most of it exits the blood vessels. Talk a bit, a bit about neurotoxicity uh, before we finish. So uh, anesthetics induce uh, neural uh, loss in newborns, apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. And this happens in certain parts of the brain. Uh, now in animal studies, it's usually after a long, deep anesthetic, and usually it results in learning disabilities uh, in, the, in the animals. For example, they can't um, navigate a maze as well as animals that didn't get exposed to an anesthetic. Uh, and we think the critical period is between the uh, third trimester to age two years in humans. But we don't know. We really don't have good evidence that it actually even exists in humans. And it seems that the anesthetic agents that cause the most neurotoxicity are those that are given in combinations such as isoflurane and nitrous, or isoflurane and benzodiazepines. Probably the same thing applies to sevoflurane. Some drugs uh, cause moderate neurotoxicity, especially agents that are given alone, one, one agent only. Some drugs have no neurotoxicity associated with them in animal studies, and some drugs we just don't know about. So our goal over the next 10 years, I think, is to uh, figure out which drugs cause neurotoxicity and avoid them, develop alternate techniques. Um, and uh, one thing we do do nowadays is we try to delay surgery in infants until they're out of that two-year uh, window when they can have neurotoxicity. Uh, there's still lots of going animal and uh, human population studies uh, trying to figure this out. Uh, but this is an issue that comes up quite frequently uh, with parents. Um, and uh, as healthcare providers, we also uh, consider it. Uh, so... Um, that's all I'll say about that. So thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me.